So I want to welcome you to the informational webinar. We are so happy and so excited to discuss the first ever statewide Kentucky Reading Academies. We know that your districts continue to face just unprecedented challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a result, we believe that teachers need unprecedented support. So we're hopeful that this opportunity will be one key mechanism for providing high quality literacy instructional support to teachers across the Commonwealth. So today um, we're going to begin by, hopefully if I can advance my slide here, um, introducing myself and our Alexia partners. So my name is Mickey Ray and I'm the Chief Academic Officer in the Office of Teaching and Learning. And I also have with us today Ruth Swanson. And I don't know, Ruth, if you want to turn your camera on and let them see um, you as well. But Ruth is the connection to the Office of Continuous Improvement and Support and has just been a great partner to us in this work. And so she is with us today as well. And then I have many other support from the Office of Teaching and Learning um, who are here, uh, frankly, to, to um, work behind the scenes to, to make sure that all of this is in place for um, the ease of the webinar today. So I'm very thankful to have them on the call as well. And then next we have our Lexia partners. And I would love um, for you to have the opportunity to meet Susan Griffin, Tony Backstrom, and Cassandra Wheeler. And they will be talking to you more today specifically about the element of letters and the course study that's associated with the letters professional learning, um, which is why I know many of you are here today to get more of those specifics. I'm very grateful that they have been able to join us today. And in terms of the webinar goals, as I stated, we, we really want you to be able to learn more about the academies, about the structure of the letters training itself. We'd like to discuss with you how schools and districts can support the teacher participants who are opting into this opportunity. And then at the end, be able to have some time to address questions that you may have about the academy and about the letters coursework that we did not address in the first part of our programming for today. And I'd like to begin by discussing the purpose for the Reading Academies. One of the key tenets of the United We Learn initiative, which Dr. Glass very passionately um, believes in curated from the report of stakeholders across the state, one of the key tenets is creating vibrant student experiences. And in his kickoff video, Dr. Glass makes the point that a child's ability to read is a critical predictor of both educational and lifelong success. And so we know that students must have every opportunity to learn to read independently and proficiently and to strengthen their reading skills throughout that K through five progression. So teachers must be equipped and empowered in the teaching of reading in order to best support their students. So to support that goal, the Kentucky Department of Education is launching the Kentucky Reading Academies, which brings letters, the language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, professional learning opportunity to educators across our state. And through letters, teachers will gain essential knowledge in the fundamentals of literacy instruction that are required to transform student learning and create more vibrant experiences for our youngest readers across the Commonwealth. And this really began um, with a, an evidence basis in Mississippi. So they, they provided the initial research basis for the work that we are now engaging in. But there are many other states now who have partnered um, with letters to, to bring that professional learning opportunity to their state. Um, but specifically, Mississippi is just one example of how evidence based professional learning on how students learn to read and why some students struggle can truly transform student outcomes. And just to give a little bit of history, in 2013, the Mississippi legislature passed their Literacy Act and implemented letters professional learning to all K-3 through teachers across their state. And this commitment um, with many stakeholders, including state, local, higher education leaders, 
it has resulted in continuous improvement year after year. And the, this statewide approach to letters implementation has catapulted Mississippi, which is a state that has historically been low performing, to the one state, to the only state in our country who had increased scores overall on the 2019 National Assessment of Educational Progress. And so you can see there on the map, Kentucky was one of 17 states who are actually in a period of decline, and Mississippi is that one state that showed gains during that same period. And when you hear wow. Dr. Carey Wright discuss why and how that this has happened and, and the way that they have been able to transform um, some of that professional learning within their state, she says, and she always says, they made an investment in people. And so again, this, this really is about providing professional learning for teachers in Kentucky following a very similar model. And I wanna make sure that I state here that Letters is not a program, so it's not a comprehensive reading program, it's not an intervention program, it is professional learning. So this is a training opportunity for educators across our state and um, this learning from the letters training can be implemented no matter the locally selected reading or intervention program. And to talk a little bit about the funding basis. So really the, the, the reason why we are bringing this to you now is because we have been able to utilize some of the ESSER ARP federal funding um, in, the, in the internal KDE funds to be able to implement the statewide professional learning. And all of that funding must be expended by September of 2024. And I know that you, many of you are well-versed in, in that timeline as well. But with the passing of the Read to Succeed Act, so Senate Bill 9, um, was, was signed into law by the governor and included an emergency clause, so it's effective immediately. That gives us that $11 million each year in the budget to further this initiative. So now we have more sustainable funds beyond 2024 to really make an investment in teachers and in professional learning and in a coaching model that will be implemented um, at a later date. So we want to make sure that we're moving um, slowly so that we are able to develop what will be needed and have the systemic supports in place for the coaching model that would follow. Um, in terms of eligible educators, if you are an, a K through five educator in a Kentucky public school, you are eligible for this professional learning opportunity. And you can see here on the screen, um, we do have the note that it, it in, includes general educators, special educators. If you're a reading specialist and interventionist, um, I've received a lot of emails from school and district level coaches, those who teach EL students, tier one schools, and then absolutely administrators. So we are targeting 2,400 teachers in the first phase of this of this work. And we hope to have representation from all eight of Kentucky's educational cooperatives. And so we want to encourage participation from whole schools, from grade level teams, across districts. We know that this the more systemic approach is going to lead to more um, successful implementation and, and, and the connection to student outcomes. Um, and we also encourage administrator participation for that very reason, for sustainability and to support the teachers who are going through the professional learning within your buildings. But there is flexibility there. So we are allowing for individual teachers to sign up. Um, we want anyone who is interested in this professional learning to have the chance, the opportunity to go through the training. Um, so we are very excited about the potential that we have to reach educators across our state who would like to participate in this first phase. So I'm going to um, turn it over now to our partners um, with Lexia to talk a little bit more specifically about the letters coursework. So Tony, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mickey. And I have to say, it's pretty exciting to be a part of this as we hear you talk at, about the initiative and about the work that's already gone in when we hear Dr. Glass and, and the importance of this work and the commitment that the entire department is doing. Um, we are very proud to partner with the Commonwealth as we move forward. I think when we talk about this, this section on letters and to try to give some more information and some depth to an understanding of what you might be embarking on if you um, choose to be a part of this, we wanna give you a really quick overview. I promise it will be quick. We wanna talk about what's a part of that and those materials 
and then really talk for a few minutes about some of those expectations. We want you to step in, to lean in with your eyes wide open to this incredible opportunity that's being afforded to, the, to you as educators. So if we advance forward, when we think about what Letters is, Letters is, as Mickey said previously, pure professional learning. She mentioned it is not a curriculum. It is not a full class course work um, with your students. It is not an intervention. This really is an investment in you as educators and in your expertise, helping you to enhance your understanding of English and the literacy skills that students have to acquire. It really is gonna help you understand that neuroscience of how students actually learn to read and write. It's going to give you an understanding of what to teach and when, and sometimes for some students, how often to circle back and, and help them if they struggle. It's gonna help you understand why some students struggle, which is incredible information to have to be really intentional in the instructional decisions that you make. And again, this is that learning for you to empower you to make the best decisions with all of those tools that your district has provided for you, that they have chosen for you to use, those curriculums and interventions. This is based on the last 40 plus years of reading research that has been replicated, that has been peer reviewed, that we continue to refine each year, there, within each year. There are multiple opportunities for new research to come in and all of that is synthesized together in one place in letters. We do ensure that you all will have that understanding and deep grounding in those big five components that the NCLB has let us know are, are important. And we go a little beyond that to really bring that whole literacy space together. So included in addition are oral language and writing and spelling and an entire understanding of the organization of language. That's really important because English is a language-based system. And we have to help students understand the language as well as those written patterns that represent that language to have all of that make sense so they can decode the words in order to comprehend. That same notion of all of our students comprehending what they're reading and being active learners and readers and interacting with the texts that they read is the end goal. And we know from all of this research that there are a number of foundational skills along the way. And we have to ensure that our students really have that in order for them to truly be able to move forward. So you'll receive all of this learning through a blended course that we'll talk about those, those, mod, those modalities in a moment. But most importantly is what does that mean for you in your classroom? Why should you go through this course of learning? When you have that deeper understanding, you will best be able to determine what and how to teach for each student in your classroom each year to be able to be successful. You'll know where they are when they step into your classroom, whenever that is at the beginning of the year or along that school year, and you'll be able to get them closer to where they need to be by the end of the year to move forward. It'll help you recognize why some students struggle. And that helps you be much more intentional in your use of the programs. And you'll be able to do that formally and informally. And when you know more, when you know better, we all can do better. And that will have an impact on your student outcomes. It empowers you to use the very best practices from research and help enhance and extend all the great things that you already do in your classroom. Just giving it a little tune up, so to speak, and deepening all of those great things that you already do. So how do we do that with letters? Letters is a blended approach to learning. We know that you all have incredible demands on your time right now. We know that 
more so than ever, the last couple of years have been incredibly challenging. And they already were prior to that. So we've developed this course of study to have you engage in asynchronous online work. A lot of that work is already there at time when you have time to be able to do it from any internet connected device that you have. That online learning is supported by print and textbooks so that you can gauge your time. If you have 15 minutes here, a half an hour there, I have 20 minutes when I'm commuting and someone else is driving that you could read. We want you to be able to do that when it makes most sense for you and is the right time for you to be able to absorb that and really focus on your learning. When we take that then, we add in live sessions as well that I'm gonna to touch on in a moment. But when we think about that online learning that's asynchronous again, on your own, online videos with experts, examples of actual classroom instruction so that you can see it in action and what it looks like, interactive activities along the way that's supported by that text, we've broken it up to be manageable. It's broken up into two volumes. Each of those volumes have four units, four units roughly done over a school year. So for the full letters course, it is intended to be done over two school years, and that's intentional. This means that you will not be completely overwhelmed and unable to participate in that online work or attend facilitated sessions and still do everything that you have to do every day. It will add a little time, but it's manageable time. And because of the way it is set up, so these volumes are being broken down into sessions. And with each of those sessions, there are pieces that directly connect back to what you're doing every day. So while you are making an investment of your time, you are able to apply what you are learning immediately all along the way in the work that you do every day. So each of those units are broken into sessions I mentioned. So in each of those sessions, we want you to complete that online content. Again, you can do it in 15 or 20 minute increments. Each one of those is 45 minutes to maybe just over an hour on average. We want you to read that text. That might take you 10 to 20 minutes for each of those sessions. There's a check for understanding. I love it, and as most people do, I sometimes want to check, am I really learning what I should be here? Am I paying close enough attention? I get distracted by something. A quick check, just to be sure that you're on track for success. And then there's that bridge to practice. That is that intentional transfer of what you're learning and applying it to what you're doing in your classroom. It's like a mini case study. I promise it will not add hours to your workload every week. I promise. They are quick activities, reviews, reflections to think about your learning and how that applies to two or three students that you work with. Each of those sessions of in the first volume in each of those first four units, there are eight sessions in each unit, just to give you an idea. But then for each of those units, you will have completed each of those sessions. You'll complete all those bridge to practice activities. And then we do another quick check. How is your learning as you're going through the content? Was there something that you thought you really understood at the first point when you, when you heard it, but now it's been a little time, you've added a little more learning on, and you're, there's some confusion around that. We want you to be able to know that so that we can help to address that. And at that point, you'll attend live facilitated training. Sometimes that might be online in a live session. Sometimes that might be on site. We have options available and you'll have options for how that is um, consumed by you and or your districts. So that combination of multiple modalities provides for multiple exposures to information. We all learn best when we don't hear something once and then we never hear it again. We need to hear it more than one time and we need to be able to actually utilize information 
in order for us to retain it and actually have it become part of our habits, part of our practices. Those quick checks and understandings, those assessments, I don't want you to be too concerned about those. As long as you're going through that asynchronous course and you're doing that reading, you are going to be just fine. We want everybody to strive to reach for a goal of mastery at 80% proficiency with each of those. Those quick checks at the end of each of those sessions are only five questions. And at the end of those assessments, they're 10 to 15 questions. It's not some big test that we want you to be anxious about. Instead, we want you to use it as a way to check on your learning and as you come into those live facilitated sessions to recognize if you have any confusions because those sessions, those live sessions with our experts are the opportunity to ask questions of the experts, to ask questions of your peers, to challenge, to ensure that you're really understanding what that research meant and how it applies to what you do every day. When we think about that in that bridge to practice, I, I always come back to this because sometimes it can be a little anxiety producing. And again, we don't want that to be the case with any of this learning because this is an investment in you to make you even better at what you already do. So those bridge to practice activities, for instance, this happens to be from unit four, session two. Um, in unit four, session two, we're talking about advanced decoding. And this bridge to practice is on phoneme grapheme correspondences or the written symbols to the sounds they represent in the language. As you'll see, there's instructions that are right there. It's gonna take you, you know, 15 to 20 minutes maybe. And there's a downloadable file in that online system that you would be able to download. And as Mickey transfers to the next slide, you'll actually see some of that information. We'll actually show and talk about typically, so not in every curriculum, not in every intervention, but typically here are kind of the grade levels when those written patterns for our sound structure are introduced. When, when we read them, our students should be able and should be working toward being able to master and how that also translates into spelling. Now, you might have already noticed on some of these that it doesn't always match exactly. Well, there's a reason for that. In order to encode something, to write it, to spell it and understand that, we likely have to have been able to see it before and interacted with it before and part of that decoding. And so that spelling and, and writing follows the ability to decode and each of those pattern structures are introduced at different times based on their frequency. So some students may not see every way that a sound is spelled immediately and that's okay. So you'll see that some of that there and throughout that course, you're going to get the explanation and the reasoning behind all of that so that it all makes sense. It'll help you as you look at the things that you do every day and how to make improvements, how to make those decisions with your students every day. Now, the other thing that I do want to mention um, is those live sessions. You will be given links once you've registered and are into that process, you'll have the ability to come back and register for what works best with your schedule for those sessions. Again, many of them will be virtual because that lends a lot of flexibility to your schedule, to your district or school schedule. There will be other opportunities for those chances outside of contract days for evenings or Saturdays. We know that sometimes that presents other challenges as well. We always wanna make sure that there is the maximum flexibility so that any challenge that comes up, there's an opportunity to solve for that. And then the final thing that I'll mention as we're together um, with me today is that at the beginning and the end of each of the volumes, there's a pre and post assessment. These are not intended to be punitive. I don't want you to be anxious about thinking about that either. 
the pretest at the beginning of each volume is like a pretest you might use with your students anytime you're giving a pretest. You likely do not expect your students to know all the answers on a pretest. You're really gauging where their understanding is before you're actually going to teach the content. And that is the same expectation here. This is a pretest to you know your baseline for you to set and understand, okay, I, I know some of this. I know some of this I'm grasping. This is great. And I still have information that I can learn. It helps to think about what all goes into in that volume one work, all those foundational skills and really going down into some of those foundational skills and testing, because I can tell you, it's sometimes difficult to go backwards and think about how simple we have to make things sometimes in order for us to build those blocks for our students to be able to move forward. So when you get ready to take that pretest, don't worry about Googling the answers. Don't worry about phoning a friend. It's a baseline. And similarly, when you come to that post test after unit four, you will have had all those check for understandings and all those unit assessments along the way. You are going to have a great idea of exactly how well you have already mastered this content because you will have those checks all along the way. And we still don't expect 100%. We want everyone to strive for that goal of mastery at 80%. And know that you have that support along the way as you get there. So, Mickey, I think I'm going to turn it back over to you as we continue on. And we'll stay to help answer questions with your team. Thank you so much, Tony. Yes, I'd like to talk a little bit more now about district support and so what this could possibly look like um, within your buildings, within um, schools across your district. So the first thing that we want to encourage um, is, is that teachers have opportunities to collaborate and to work together through the reading academies, either through a PLC or within their grade level teams. We also want to encourage teachers to have time to in that PLC be able to discuss the content, be able to talk about the bridge to practice supports and that application of the learning to their students within their classrooms. And then again, just giving them the chance to share what they are learning with other colleagues on a regular basis who may or may not be participating in phase one of the work. Um, and then as, as the administrator, um, obviously you will be key in allowing for that collaboration, both in protecting time and in and generating space for those conversations to occur. And if the administrator is completing the training with the participants, then we think that that will allow for very organic conversations that would occur around the content and the learning and what they would be seeing within, within classrooms. And then the next step is just time. <laughs> and we know that time is so precious and we're all very limited in, in, in having time. So we think that again, if school leaders, district leaders can work together to protect that time for educators who are participating in the professional learning, that will allow them again to be able to collaborate within their PLCs, to work through the lessons together, to have rich discussion around the content and be able to think about the application to their classrooms. Um, you may also consider using ESSER or other district funds to provide release time or maybe substitutes for teachers for occasionally if, as needed to complete the work and then to be able to work together to think about those bridge to practice supports. The next little component involves registration and how you can do that. So on the Kentucky Reading Academy's webpage, on the KDE webpage, there is a direct link to the registration form um, that is hopefully being placed in the chat for you now. If, if, if you would like to visit the website, you can go there um, and see the registration link. It is a situation in which we do need the individual teachers to register, or if you're participating as a coach, as an administrator, to complete that registration form for yourself so that we um, make sure that the license is transferred to you as the individual educator. If you have follow-up questions that are not addressed today, um, you have my email address here. I would love for you to, to send an email. Um, I, I am very happy to support you. I'm very excited for this initiative, so I want you to have the answers to your questions. I want you to be able to make informed decisions moving forward. So my contact information is there. We also have Ruth's information there. 
And then in terms of the slideshow, that's it. So I want to stop sharing so that I'm able to more directly um, respond to questions that you may have in the chat or from the KDE team that you can sort of pull over for us that are common across uh, maybe the parking lot form. Thank you okay. guys so much for your work to bring this to Kentucky. I'm so excited. Thank you, Abby. I appreciate you. Okay. I noticed I wanted to jump in. There's been a couple Please. of questions around um, how long the live sessions are, how much time that will take. And I know that we're answering in the chat and sometimes it's hard to track um, for everybody and when you asked and when they're answered. And since I saw it a couple of times already, it might be good to let everybody know that um, for the content, there are those eight units that you'll do the online learning, that asynchronous work in the print with the bridge to practice. Each of those for those live facilitations have it has a six hour training. So eight six hour trainings. Those trainings might be done in, in a six hour full day or two three hour sessions. So that again, we're always trying to accommodate as much flexibility as possible for schedules. And again, we anticipate that four of those would be done in each school year, four units in year one and then four units in year two. So either four full days or eight three hour sessions in each year, if that helps as well. And so, Tony, I have a couple of questions that I would like for you to address that I've seen in the chat and then also on the parking lot. The first um, is, what if my school doesn't have Lexia? Can I still participate? Will you explain that umbrella just a little bit for, for the- Absolutely. For the Absolutely. So, Lexia is um, a company that we have our professional learning, which is letters. And completely separately, we also do have a couple of intervention programs. This opportunity with letters is for that professional learning that is letters. It is not tied to any curriculum or any intervention. Your school can use any curriculum or any intervention, and we still love for you to participate in letters. Um, if you find that way down the road at some point, you want to reach out to Lexia, um, about one of those interventions, you certainly can do that, but that is completely separate from this letters initiative. This is really for that professional learning, no matter what curriculum or interventions you have in use in your districts. And, and Tony, I know that you have, you've stated this, but I think it's so important for you, Bill. So there are some questions around, um, you know, why they would necessarily have a need for substitute teachers and how, how long each of the sessions will take. And so I, I will address that a little bit, but I ask that you please correct any misinformation or that you um, circle back and, and affirm that that I, that I am speaking correctly on this. But so at the end of each unit, teachers will have the opportunity and um, I'm assuming I get administrators as well, but that is something that Tony is nodding your head. So that's wonderful. So teachers will have the opportunity to select again, either a three, two, three hour sessions at the end of the unit or one longer six hour session. So if, for example, you have educators in your building um, who are choosing the six hour session and it's during a school day, well, they would obviously need to speak to you about that because a sub would be needed. And um, if that doesn't work, then they would need to select a different time slot, but there will be many choices in terms of when they can sign up for the live session, the live online session, or potentially an in-person session that would happen at the end of each unit. Is there anything, Tony, you would add and or clarify based on my response there? <laughs> Nothing to clarify. I think everything you said is absolutely true. Sometimes um, there might be within a district, if a district decided to take on this initiative as a systemic approach or an entire school building, um, there could be time where they wanted to provide time for their teachers to complete some of that asynchronous work or that reading. And some places across the country have done that. 
and they have provided a sub. Um, typically, however, it's only if that's needed when that live facilitated session takes place after each unit, either in those three hour segments or in that six hour segment. Thank you, Tony. And I know that there was something about, you know, can a single teacher at a district or a school um, sign up? Yes, we yes, always sir. encourage you to invite your friends in to, to join you and to be part of that. Um, when we are embarking on a learning journey, it's, it's always comforting to know that you have someone along there with you that you know already to ask questions. That does not preclude you if you don't have anyone in your building who wants to do it with you. And as you come into those live sessions, um, you will feel part of a community and you will build a network within those live sessions that is part of their makeup is to help build that community around this learning. And Tony, could you clarify as well, you know, I, there are some questions around, you know, should coaches participate? And I have, I've addressed this question via email more than once. And, and I actually recommend that coaches, literacy coaches, either for a school building or for a district would go through the full eight unit teacher session, educator session, because in support of those teachers who are participating in the process, I would think you would want that same exact learning that they're experiencing in order to be able to provide that ongoing support for them. Now, if you are a building level administrator, um, I think it would, based on your time and the different needs that you may have, um, there is that administrator session. And so, Tony, can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two, please? Sure, I absolutely echo your support of coaches going through that full letters, third edition, that full course um, of eight units for coaches. Um, when we think about administrators, um, it, for me, it's always kind of a little of a catch-22. I love it when administrators have the time available to them and are able to complete that full content with their teachers and really dig deep into that understanding around the literacy process. And we all have to be very open and honest about the challenges that administrators have on their time. And some, there are situations where they cannot submit to that much of their time to, to do that over the course of those two years. So the administrator course does provide an overview of that full letters course. So instead of a full two years, over those eight units, they'll get an overview of each of those eight units. And then something that is unique to administrators, there's a whole section for them around what it means to be an instructional leader, how to keep the focus on literacy, what to look for in classrooms when you go in, especially those classrooms where teachers are receiving letters training and, and how to ensure that the best choices are being made and, and how to be a part of that process around that intentional instruction that, that should be taking place. So for administrators, a lot of it depends on the time available um, if you could do both, that would be fantastic. Um, and we recognize that that is very difficult with the workload and, and the expectations that, that administrators have with all of those duties. But coaches, absolutely, I recommend the full eight units of, of letters to go through with their teachers. And I'm seeing some questions about timeline and, um, you know, it, the way that teachers will be selected. So we do have, again, 2,400 slots for the first phase of this work. Um, right now, we have approximately 300 people who have already registered, so that I'm thrilled about that, but also hoping that today, after the webinar, we'll see that number. Yes, Cassandra has her palm palms for us. Um, that we'll be able to see that number increase. And so the way that, you know, if, if we have exactly 2400 registrants um, then of course you know th that would be a much easier process of determining um, how we will move on in phase one but if we did happen to have a scenario in which we have 2500 teachers or 3000 teachers register um, we we will be prioritizing based on need so those schools that have the greatest need um, and i think that everyone would understand and acknowledge why that would want to be part of our prioritization of this work um, but i will also say that 
this is not a one and done with that funding and with the chance to move forward in multiple phases we want every teacher every educator every coach every administrator who wants this opportunity to be able to participate so if if we have the glorious scenario, which we fill every single slot in phase one. Please know that there will be a phase two to this work, a phase three. This is something that we're committed to at the agency and will be ongoing work moving forward. Um, and the registration window, um, it will be open. I, I think right now it's going to be open through at least the end of July, that first week of August, but we will be communicating um, kind of a last call, so to speak, um, for educators before we move into, into the work. But the plan is that this would actually begin. So the first cohort would kick off their professional learning um, in September of 2022. So I saw a few questions regarding that. I had a question. Yes, Lori. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. How are you? I'm good. How about you? It's good to see you. Yes, your good question, you please. Too. You know, I'm always involved in everything that goes on. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so um, I'm interested in um, how the higher ed people would attend this because I'm fo my focus is literacy and so is one of my elementary people. And so I was just wondering what the cost would be for like us to attend something like this. Absolutely. And, and that that is the thing. I, I know that I can coordinate with uh, my partners here from Letters to get you uh, the more specific participation amount. But we would love for you, love for you to join and be able to come alongside of the other Kentucky teachers who are participating in this phase. Um, and Dr. Henderson, again, just, just so you know, too, kind of a, a long-term goal is that eventually we would be able to provide more direct supports for pre-service teachers and, and um, for higher ed as well. If there is interest there, but um, but for you specifically, we will make note and follow up with you to make sure that you get um, the the cost for participation. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Mickey. If I may, we had a couple of questions in the Please. parking lot related to those that have applied. <clears throat> excuse me for the RTA grant. So that would ultimately be, a, you know, a school level decision, district decision based on the grant. If they if they are awarded the RTA grant and they have the funding via the grant that they would like to use for letters, then they certainly can move forward in that way. But I would also say that um, there's the potential there for those grantees to register um, in the the, the current phase one cohort um, to ensure that they are they have the option of having the training moving forward. Anything else that you all see that we can address in the moment? We had a question regarding um, if completing this course would change rank. Okay, rank changes. So, so right now um, that we have no mechanism for this to go toward um, graduate credit for a rank change, but we are working with um, Ole to try to find a mechanism. Some states do have agreements with a particular university to provide up to 12 hours of graduate credit, and Kentucky is not one of those states currently, but we're going to move forward to see if they would like to apply to um, work with our state to, to move forward in that. So the honest answer at the moment is no, but it is a work in progress, and we will certainly be providing more information to participants if something connected to that does change. And there's a question, is there a cost for the district other than the stipend or sub, sub pay? And um, in terms of the actual professional learning course, no, there's not. So all of that is covered in our partnership with with Lexia for the professional learning. And so it would be a matter, again, um, of you as a district determining the connections to the sub pay as needed and if you would like to award a, a stipend. My KDE friends, is there anything else that you can see 
Um, so we, we have a question, will we receive a copy of the book or will we have to read it online? And that's the beautiful thing. It's in both places. So you'll have access to on to on online experience, but you'll also get um, the, a spiral bound book that's glorious that you can highlight and put notes in the margins. Yeah, thank you. So, so if you can see Cassandra's video, she's showing it now like a beautiful Vanna White horse. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. We did have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Crystal, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, there is a question in the in the parking lot. Uh, for clarification, you had mentioned on site training versus online training. Would that be all participants in a district if they're participating? Um, and is that based on need or how will that be determined? So Tony, please correct me again if, I, if I'm wrong, but right now, all of those sessions at the end of the unit would be online. And that's because at this point, um, Lexia has not really opened themselves up for their, their facilitators to travel on site. But if that were to change, um, then it would be all participants in a particular cohort would come together for an in-person session. You know, and that might end up being at one of the regional cooperatives. If, if you have a full cohort of participants within your district, that might be on site at your district, um, but we know that moving forward at this time, we anticipate that for the moment, those will be virtual sessions. You were right on point. And the only thing I would add is that we will, even when we can um, go back to being on site, we will always offer virtual because it increases that flexibility to be able to meet the needs of the teachers within those districts if the timing in different hours or breaking it into two, three hour sessions works better. Um, our goal is to, is to work with the team there to make sure that we offer as many options as possible to make it as flexible as possible. And Tony, I saw one other comment from um, Christy from Southeast South Central, and she's asking if she can participate as a representative from the co-op to support teachers within the region. And you know, obviously, I would talk, I would speak to your director, but I would say if it's solely my decision, absolutely, we would love for you to attend. And you may even want to think about Christy. Um, following the facilitator path as well to be able to support that in your region as we move forward in these different phases. And we can speak more about that as well as we move forward. Thank you. We do have a question regarding, and I apologize if this has already been addressed. I'm kind of navigating the questions, make sure everybody has what they need. Do we have an anticipated date when um, they could hear back if they are able to participate? participate in the program. So Sarah, we know that registration will close at the, at the end of August, the very, or excuse me, at the end of July, the beginning of August. And so there would be some communication Although that I'll would go out at the beginning Diana's of um, that academic year to let individuals know that they have been selected. I don't think it can be sooner because we want to make sure that we leave the registration window open um, through the summer for as long as possible to allow as many teachers who want to participate to register. Um, but as soon as we can, um, I assure you, we'll, we will let you know. I think we just had somebody ask for that registration form again. So we might wanna put that link in there. Thank um, you, thank you. Tony. Yeah, because I know they can get lost in all of the the questions and answers in there. I think it's phenomenal that you have people that are asking questions further down the road already. They're excited and they're committed. Um, the number of, of excited people that got on this webinar today um, is a testament to the work that KDE has already been doing around this. So kudos to all of you there in Kentucky. Well, and, and again, the, the real kudos goes to you educators who are here and who are willing to give up your time. And again, we know that you have the one of the most challenging jobs in the world. And so I'm just so thankful that you would be willing to give us time and space um, and make the time to continue on with your learning in this area for the good of your students. And um, I mean, honestly, it, it gives me goosebumps to think about this and, and just the hope that I have that this can be so impactful for you and, and for the students in your in your classrooms and in your buildings and across your district. 
Um, and we do have another question around where will I find the recorded webinar? And so that will be posted on the Kentucky Reading Academy's webpage. And on that page, you'll find a link to the registration. There's sort of a mini FAQ that's embedded um, on that webpage. And then you have a, kind of a kickoff video from Dr. Glass that he was kind enough to do to support this great work. Um, so I would encourage you to visit the webpage if you have not already. And I know that we have several people I'm dropping that into the chat for you. Thank you all. Okay, there was a question about the facilitator course. Um, so I saw that after the first year you can take the facilitator course. Can you speak more to that? And Tony, it is the same course, correct? Can you talk about that just a, a little bit? Sure. So for the long term sustainability within the state of Kentucky, they will certify facilitators who in time would begin to help provide that live facilitation um, of teachers going through the course that we will be doing at, at first. Um, there are some minimum requirements that you have to do. And the first one is you have to complete volume one first on that post test. You have to score an 88 percent or higher. So if you're thinking about something like that, you want to keep that in mind. From there, then there's additional training that you attend. There are additional materials that you would receive. Um, and I'm not sure if there might be some other parameters as we work through this first year and going through um, of those expectations for if someone is then a facilitator, um, what will Kentucky want you to be able to agree to as you continue to move forward. Um, but at the very beginning, at least, would be an 88% or higher on that post test of volume one. And then it would be the same one for volume two. And while as a participant, we want you to reach for that mastery goal of 80%, in order to be a facilitator, it must be an 88%. And so there's a little bit of difference there. Um, if we're going to have someone who's going to facilitate other teachers through, we wanna make sure that their understanding of that content is at the very highest level. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. And I am dropping um, these answers you've made that you've given us, Tony, into the chat as well. So the, for the facilitator would have 88% mastery. Is that correct. correct? Okay, excellent. I am going to uh, differentiate that in the chat. Perfect. Thank we you do so have much. a question about what happens if you score lower than the 88%. Well, first I have to say, I don't think anything anybody in Kentucky is likely going to do that. So I'm not sure that this is even anything we really need to talk about. Remember, there are those supports along the way, the check for understandings and those unit assessments so that you should have a really good idea. If you really want to be a facilitator and you do not receive that 88%, we do have a process um, of, uh, that has to be followed in order to get a second try at that post-test. And so rather than walking through all of those pieces right now for those that may not be interested in that, as we get to that point, we'll make sure that we're working with the KDE team and the information that they send out to those who indicate interest um, to be able to walk everybody through that at that point. Um, but I love that there's already interest in it um, and that you're aware of that 88% so that you can work and study really hard along the way. And there's a question, if our teachers register and we do get the RTA grant to use toward letters, um, will we be penalized for teachers un unregistering? And, and I will say, no, <laughs> you will not be penalized. I would ask that you let us know. And so that way we can make sure that those slots are open for other educators who are registering at the same time as you are. Uh, but there will be... Uh, Frankly, I'm just so very happy that you want the training and that you're willing to go through multiple steps to ensure that your teachers are supported in this way. So thank you for that question. If I may piggyback on with that, because we had another question earlier, which was asking about amending their application to be able to use a different program for the RTA grant and then preserve letters opportunity through the registration um, like others. So Sarah, I, I do not want to misspeak on that. To me, that, that seems um, trickier. <laughs> 
And so I would not want to say one way or the other without talking to the grant director and making sure that um, we speak to the Office of Finance and Operations in terms of that process. Um, but I think that the bottom line is if, if you have questions connected to RTA and you, you are an awardee, um, then we will we'll make sure that we will work with you to do what is best for your teachers within your building, um, whether or not you have received the grant. So um, I would just ask if you could have a little patience with us today on that part of the question, because I do not want to misspeak and, and lead you astray related to that. Okay, um, and I have some questions about if you are serving a different role, if you work for a co-op, if you're an administrator, if you are a district leader, when you go into the registration form, um, you will actually select your role. And if you don't see that your role is included in the list, there's an other and you can place your, your role there in the blank. So that's the way we will curate the different slots um, that will go for, for the trainings that are being selected. Um, and again, we have a question around the criteria for registrants in cohort one. So again, I hope that we have all 2400 slots um, filled with interested educators to complete this work. If we were to have more than 2400, then we would start looking and prioritizing schools with greatest need. Um, but as I said earlier, um, there will be more than one phase of this work and that that is the beauty of us having some additional funding our ESSER funding as well as the read to succeed fund so if you are not a part of phase one there will be multiple opportunities to participate okay is there anything else that i have missed um my kde friends that you've seen that we should address before we go today. Nikki, while you all are checking that, I just want to say hello to everyone. Thank you so much and to tell you how excited I am to be on this journey with you all and hope to be a resource for you as we work together in moving towards the implementation of this. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. I do have a couple of new questions. If we uh, still have time to respond to those as well. Um, I had someone ask if a teacher signs up, but then becomes an administrator, um, do they need to do anything differently? Oh, thank you, Thomas. Thomas just populated my email for me. And Sarah, I was multitasking and heard your question, girl, so I'm going to address that now. So <laughs> I would say you would need to let us know if that change in role, as Tony mentioned, she thinks it's a beautiful thing, a lovely thing, if an administrator has the time and space to be able to complete the full course. So that would be your choice. But we could also adjust um, and move you into the administrator slot if and role if, if that works better for you when if that happens and there's a change. For those that are an instructional coach, they would sign up as an educator or an administrator. We have recommended as an educator so that they get the full coursework to support the teachers that they're working with. Now that is a that's a really good question. So Kimberly, I am watching you as you are typing. And so Tony, you may be able to address this for us. So she's asking, what if you do not have a classroom to get data around the bridge to practice and other things? How how how, how do you all handle that? So we, we always recommend first, if there's an opportunity to partner with a teacher who does have students, if you are an administrator or um, someone who's in a building and you might be able to partner. Um, and so you might adjust it just a little in that setting where you may not be um, providing that activity, but you would be observing and then documenting and, and reflecting. If that's not possible, there are some other options. Um, we have had folks who have used their children, their grandchildren, their nieces, their nephews, their neighbor kids, and, and utilized <laughs> from that setting, right? It, teachers are resourceful. Mm -hmm. um, and so typically there is um, a student somewhere that they might have access to, to help with. Depending on their role, and, and often it's administrators that, that have that question because they are not in the classroom every yes. day working with the students. Even if, they pause 
and reflect on what that bridge to practice is asking of an educator who is working with students and what the implications of that might be for those that instruction moving forward and the choices that are being made. That in and of itself is powerful and what the intent of the bridge to practice is if that's their role. So I think there's not one simple answer to that question. There are some options available depending on what their role is. Um, Cassandra is with our customer success team and she'll be really involved as we move forward. And if there are ever very specific questions from someone that come up, you know, they are they beautifully handle those and can help to provide additional options along the way as well. Yeah, and a couple that I'll offer just in light of that question is, as you're going through this experience, you all talked earlier about having, uh, a, you know, a cohort in your building or having a buddy as you're going through this experience, we absolutely encourage that. And if you can create a professional learning community, your own PLC within that group. So let's say you're an instructional coach and maybe you don't have the access to your own classroom of students. Get with other instructional coaches, take that bridge to practice and role play. Right. Someone, you, you know, do a profile of a student. One of you role play as the student, the other role play as the teacher. That way you can work out the pedagogy and the instructional practices, because that's still going to help you as you return back to your teachers and provide coaching and supports for them as they work for their students. So we've got all kinds of great ideas and brainstorming that we can do to make sure that anybody from any entity can still have a very positive, powerful, impactful experience with their letters coursework. Thank you, Cassandra. And I will just ask Tony, is there ever a scenario, I, I can't envision a scenario which we would encourage an administrator to take both the administrator course and the teacher course. Like if they're, if they're taking the teacher course, like to me that, that seems to be redundant, but am I wrong about that? So the first, so in the administrator course, they have that first part that is the overview of the teacher or educator course. If they're taking the educator course, that overview wouldn't really be necessary because they're going to dive deep. Experience all of it. Although okay. it might give them a little preview of what they're going to be covering with their teachers in advance of when they get to that with their teachers. The other part to that administrator course is unique to administrators. And so that's the little bit of a difference that okay. we have had instances where administrators have slowed down and gone through that full course with their teachers and still done the administrator course to get that little sneak peek, but really to focus on the other half of that administrator course, which is to really um, focus on being that instructional leader and what pieces are unique to that and how to keep that focus and look at data and set up the structures and look at curriculums and interventions. And how do you structure all of that um, that isn't really explicitly within that full letters course? That makes more sense. And just in full transparency, um, in thinking about the numbers and the impact on the the slots that we have for educators and you know in my mind i would i really want teachers having the first shot at the at the teacher coursework and so you know potentially if we see that they're it's tight then we may ask if we see an administrator signed up in both areas that maybe in phase one the administrator could complete the administrator course get the overview and then in the later phase um, when we have more uh, slots and more flexibility then following that up with the full session or or vice versa I just want to make sure that um, while I am so thankful for administrators and for their desire to participate that those teacher slots can be filled by teachers who are working with students day in and day out. And I say that with great respect and, and love for both roles. <laughs> okay, anything else? else? As the final comments are kind of coming in, I just wanna say I'm, I'm the person that goes to the movies and watches for all the credits. I don't leave the theater until all the credits roll. That's somebody's child on that screen, right? <laughs> so as we've been sitting here in this session, I have gone from page to page. Many, some of you had your cameras open. 
Others of you have a cute, beautiful picture of yourself. Others of you just have your name. I went through all of the pages and read every person's name. We've been waiting for you. Mm -hmm. This opportunity is with you in mind. And we're so excited that you all are taking this journey. We're so excited for Mickey and the team there at the Kentucky Department of Ed to be partnered with us for this wonderful opportunity of professional letters growth and development. So I'm going to take my pom-poms officially. <laughs> And just shake them and let you know how excited we are. And, we're, and, and looking at the excitement and the enthusiasm just coming through the chat and the questions that you all are asking, you all are ready for this. And we've been preparing for this moment. And so we welcome all of you and thank you so much for taking this journey with us. Oh, that was beautifully stated. Thank you yeah. so, so much, Cassandra. And and again, I certainly share that same sentiment. I love our state. I love teachers. Um, and I so hope that you find this valuable to your practice um, and to build your expertise and to work with, with your students. So thank you for being here today. Um, and we will keep watching. And this is going to show my ignorance, but when the meeting ends, Crystal, will they still have access to the, the parking lot to add questions as, as they come in or will that stop at that point? They should still have access as long as they save that link. Perfect. And I will just say too that, um, again, you can of course email me and, and we can make sure that we get answers to your questions as well. Mickey, we are all looking forward to a beautiful, amazing journey with all of you educators in Kentucky. We're going to be with you every step of the way. Thank you so much. And Crystal, if you can pop the uh, parking lot page into the chat again so that they can have that right at the end. Oh, Sarah's got it. Thank you all so much. You all are so good. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for giving us this space in your world today. And again, we're so excited and so thankful that you're with us. And we look forward to your participation and all of this great work that I know will be done as we move forward. So thank you so much. And this will be posted on the web page as needed. You can share with your friends and colleagues. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's Brandy. I didn't see that she was with us. <laughs>